Hi. So I'm going to talk about um, a project that I've been working on as part of my um, PhD. Um, so for my PhD, I'm working on a group of fish um, recently identified called Pelagia. Um, and they include um, lots of different forms. So you have um, tuners, which are scombrids. Um, and then you have sort of things with really deep bodies. Um, so you have um, Christiids and Brahmids. You have black swallowers, which like to eat other members of Pelagia. Um, you have Gempilids and Tracheirids, which are really long and skinny. Um, so there's lots of different forms. And they're a really nice thing to look at because they have a really good fossil record, um, particularly scombrids, so tunas and mackerels. Um, and one of these um, scombrids um, is called Gastrochisma, which is a butterfly kingfish. Um, and this is quite a cool sort of fish, as if you like fish, which I do. Um, so it um, has these sort of weird natural history sort of developmental things. So um, in its juvenile form, it has these really long petrol fins, which it then loses in its adult form. Um, and it also heats its eye with um, a muscle behind its eye, which has um, developed um, twice. So it's developed in gastrochisma, um, and it's developed in billfishes, which are outside of this group. Um, and the reason we know it's like different is because they use a different eye muscle. So that's quite cool. Um, so this, um, why, why do we care about it for this talk? So this um, uh, animal has no fossil record associated with it. Um, and um, this is a published tree, um, and gastrochisma is there. Um, and in this tree, it's the sister lineage to other scombrids, but um, sort of there. But in um, some new analysis that we have, it's actually the deepest diverging branch of this group. Um, and so it's quite important. Um, and we found this specimen um, in London at the NHM, um, and it was in a big block of rock, um, and it had this massive crest sticking out the top of it. And it's like, well, that's pretty weird. Um, and so we had it prepared by Mark Graham at the NHM. Um, and then we stuck it in a CT scanner. Um, and as you can see, this specimen is fairly big. Um, so it didn't CT scan wonderfully. Um, but I segmented it nonetheless. Um, and it also has in its jaws, I haven't actually put it in this model because it messes it up a bit, where I think it's got a fish in its throat. Um, so it either died on a fish or um, a fish crawled into it after it had died, which is quite cool as well. Um, so it has um, these three characters um, that make me think that it's a scombrid. So it has this really expanded lacrimal, um, it has non-protrusible jaws, um, and it has a single row of um, premaxillary teeth. Um, and these are all characters identified by Johnson um, for scombrids. So one of the issues that I come up against is that there's actually no sort of morphological analysis for this group um, since sort of like the 1980s, 1990s. Um, and so a lot of the characters are from before like modern cladistics. Um, and so um, I was looking at this. Um, and so if you look at some characters, this is comparing to a Kono paper. Um, this is the modern gastrochisma, um, and this is the new fossil. Um, and so there's a number of characters that make us think that this is actually a fossil of gastrochisma. Um, so the first is this really big crest. It's really obvious. Um, and it's called semi-parabolic in, in the Kono paper. Um, one thing to note for this is that um, actually some of this crest might be missing because that was visible on the outside of the block of rock. So this crest could be bigger in, in, in the fossil specimen. Um, and the other thing that's unusual about this crest um, is that it has quite a sharp sort of back to it. Um, and that's sort of seen here and in here. So unfortunately, because it was such a big specimen, um, the back of the brain case is actually really poorly resolved. Um, so there's a lot of noise in the scan, um, which makes it difficult to see some of the back of the brain case. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Um, so the crest also has this really large contribution from the supraoccipitals, which is the bit at the back. So in a lot of other, if you have a big crest, you have a great, um, greater contribution from the frontals, which is here. Um, but in both of these specimens, the division is really far forward. Um, there's also this sort of shelf-like voma, um, and that's in both specimens. Um, in dorsal view, I'm just going to sort of trip through the characters, because you know. Um, there's these sort of frontals, which are large, and they're um, rounded anteriorly. Um, and it's also got this very distinctive um, shape in dorsal view. 
Um, there's also other characters away from the neurocranium. So there's these small conical teeth on the palatine. Um, and the symplectic has this really sort of, so it's quite wide at the top. I know you can only see the top of it, but take it on my word that it gets really splint-like um, behind the quadrate. Um, but one of the like sort of clinches for this, for this being gastrochismid, is that um, it has these really large cycloid scales. Um, so scombrics have lost these cycloid scales, and this is the only member of the group that retains them. Um, and so you would expect that a fossil of this group would have this prim primitive characteristic, and lo and behold, it does. So these scales here um, correlate to scales here. Um, so we think that this fossil is pro probably a gastroechismid. We're fairly confident about that. Um, however, it does have some differences. So it's probably be a different species. Um, the first is that um, gastroechisma has this crest that goes all the way to the front of the neurocranium, and that's quite distinctive. But in this new specimen, it's just a little bit further back. Um, so it's not developed all the way forwards. Um, there's also um, this prominent keel on the, um, in front of the basal sphenoid, on the parasphenoid. Um, and you can't see that in this um, fossil. Now, this comes with the proviso that, again, it wasn't very easy to segment this particular bit of the fossil. Um, and it's quite possible that this is a really thin um, sort of crest or keel, um, and I just can't get it out of the, of the scan. Um, so that might be resolved if I can get a better scan of this specimen, which I'll try and do next year. Um, there's also really prominent lateral ethmoids in um, gastrochisma, and the fossil retains this primitive, sort of um, less prominent condition. Um, maybe a different species, um, but definitely um, related to gastrochisma. So there's this huge diversity of fishes from the London clay. Um, so why have we not found anything before that is related to gastrochisma? We found things that are related to other scombrids. Um, but actually, it turns out that there are other specimens. Um, so there's these two um, brain cases that Cassier described. Um, so just to orient you on this one, you're looking down in a dorsal view, and then the crest has been like squashed over. So um, the crest is here, um, and this is the side of the brain case. So that would be here if you were looking in dorsal view. Um, so these two brain cases were described by Cassier as Bromoides brienni. Um, and they were associated with Bromoides. Um, but on closer inspection, we don't think that they are. So, um, they, so why do we think this? So um, if you compare them, just the brain cases, so I've scaled these all to the same scales, roughly. Um, so you've got this um, crest, and at the back of these, so this is a, a bit of an interesting one. So these are obviously um, prepared, and you don't know how they were found. Um, so these are curved, but this is um, like quite sharp. So I don't know whether that's a real thing or whether that is something that they've been lost during um, preparation or when they were collected or even before that. Um, they do, however, have this really big contribution from the supraoccipitals, and that's really clear in both of these specimens, um, as it is in, in the fossil and in the modern form. Um, interestingly, they do have this keel that we don't see in the new fossil. Um, and so that kind of relates them to gastroechisma. Um, they have this shelf at the back of the brain case, um, and that's clear in all of the um, specimens. Um, and they also have this really sort of highly ornamented frontal. Um, and you can see that, particularly on this specimen, you can see that. Um, and this specimen, it's got some other pieces in it. The only one that I could see, a character that I could see that I could relate to the modern form is that it has a single tooth row um, and it's embedded in the underside of this block. Um, so these fossils may actually also be related to gastroechisma um, and therefore um, this new fossil would be Bramoides just because of the taxonomy and the naming. Um, so they have um, also this like box-like shape. Um, so this is gastroechisma, this is the modern form. It has this huge myodome um, and these fossils don't have it. So they're more primitive, definitely, than this gastroechismid. So um, why, do we, um, why, why does this matter? Um, so coming back to the fact that gastroechisma is um, probably the deepest diverging branch of the Scombridae, um, this fossil um, is from the Eocene, and it actually makes a really nice calibration point 
because we can really confidently say that this is a gastrochesmid. Like, we don't think it's anything else. Um, and a lot of the scombrids from the London clay, we know that they're scombrids, but we don't really know where they fit in the tree. And so they're quite hard to use as a calibration point. Whereas this one, it's the deepest diverging branch, probably. Um, and we can use this to calibrate that particular node. Um, it's also just quite nice to be able to allocate something so confidently. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank everybody, um, particularly Mark for preparing the specimen. It's been, it's been good. So thanks.